Welcome to Gospel Commission. I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we want to try to understand the nature of covenant theology, and we want to compare it with dispensationalism, Hebraic roots, and try to understand the paradigm that those in the covenant theology camp come to the scripture with. In this series on the different theological systems, we're trying to understand how we should come and read the Old Testament and apply the Old Testament in our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. And most of the theological systems that are out there are trying to answer that question to some degree. They're trying to figure out how do we relate the New Testament and the Old Testament. And we've seen that they they do that in different ways. And so as I've been trying to figure out how to explain covenant theology, I think the best way to do it is to compare uh, dispensationalism and Hebraic roots and, and that understanding those with what covenant theology teaches. Now, first, let me say something good about covenant theology. Uh, and if you have to choose one of these three, most definitely choose covenant theology because it is going to be the most gospel-centered. And here's why. In covenant theology, when they look at the Old Testament covenants, for example, Abraham, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Moses, whatever covenant they see in the Old Testament, they will view it all through the lens of Jesus Christ. They will say that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all these covenants. So they will be able to go to Luke chapter 24, uh, verse 44 and the verses following that where Jesus says, I'm going to explain to you everything that was written in the scriptures about me, uh, that, I, that I would die, rise again, and that the gospel would be preached to all nations and repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed. And so they're able to look at that and say, yes, the Old Testament was the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. They're able to have a, uh, a lens of looking through the lens of Christ to be able to understand the prophetic meaning of the Old Testament. So this is a benefit of covenant theology, and this is why those that are in that camp, in covenant theology camp, and, and most of them will be in, the, in Calvinism, the Calvinists will, generally speaking, be more gospel-centered than other, other theological systems out there. It's because they understand that the Old Testament is to be viewed in light of the New Testament and the work of Jesus Christ and the gospel. So, but... What they do is they then add two more covenants, covenants that are not written in Scripture. Uh, of course, they have their ways to try to uh, read them into Scripture, but they're not, they're not in Scripture. And these covenants are not something that were kind of slowly developed over time. There wasn't, it wasn't given at different seasons, but instead, these covenants were from the beginning, and they've always been from the beginning to the end for everybody. They're not just for Israel. They're not just for the church. They're for everybody of all, of all time. And the first covenant is the covenant of law. Now, this covenant of law is not referring to the law of Moses. It's referring to the, a philosophical idea that God is so holy and perfect that he cannot relate with his creatures except by uh, on the standard of perfection. So the only way for a person to be saved under the covenant of law is to perfectly obey everything that God has ever said. Now, this is why Adam, when he sinned one time, fell under the condemnation and the wrath of God because he did not keep that that covenant of law, the, it's not written in scripture, but that covenant of law that is, is seen through the eyes of covenant theology, that covenant of law was not kept and he fell and because of that he was condemned. But there's another covenant, it's the covenant of grace. Now this covenant of grace refers to what Jesus Christ was going to do on the cross and that anybody could receive it through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, or, except, example, in the Old Testament, then when they didn't know about Jesus Christ, they didn't know that he was going to die and rise again, but they could, by trusting in God, God could apply what Christ did to their lives and give them grace. In their mind, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law. He perfectly fulfilled this covenant of law to such a degree that he was so pleasing to God that now he can apply that merit to anybody who trusts in him. And so they can be made perfect in the eyes of God. They can, be, they can fulfill that perfect standard because of what Jesus Christ has done for, this, for them. So there's some issues in this, some philosophical issues in the way they view this covenant of grace. But overall, it's a, a gospel-centered message that is through trusting in God through Christ that we are justified before God. Now... But they go further than this, and they have various reasons for this. But uh, first of all, one of the things that they do is they'll say that in the Old Testament, people were saved in the exact same way they're saved now. Now, if we say that they're saved through faith, okay, we can agree with that. But the problem is that in the New Testament, whenever somebody repents and trusts in Christ, they are forgiven of their sins, they're justified before God, but they are also given the Spirit of God from Jesus Christ who's seated at the right hand of God and they are spiritually raised up and seated with Christ in heavenly places. They become the children of God and are adopted through the Son of God 
who went to the cross for them and now sits at the right hand of God making intercession for them. In covenant theology, most of them are going to be Calvinists, and so they believe that a man cannot repent and trust in Christ unless they have already been regenerated or born again in their heart, that they've already received the Spirit of God and been raised up and seated with Christ. So how can this happen to David or to Moses or to Abraham in the Old Testament? Of course, how could they repent and believe? Well, they would have to be born again first, according to Calvinistic theology. So they will say that Abraham and and Moses and David, they were born again in the exact same way. They were regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit, which led them to repent and believe, and therefore they were raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. The problem with this is that historically, Jesus Christ was not yet crucified, risen to the right hand of God. He wasn't even incarnate yet. And so he wasn't pouring out the Spirit of God on everyone who repented and trusted in him. And he wasn't sitting there making intercession for them. So when we go to the Old Testament to imagine that they are raised up with Christ before Christ is raised up is completely unbiblical and it's completely untenable. Now they need it in the, they need that in their theological system in order to explain away why people in the Old Testament could repent and believe without first being born again. So they just say, well, they were born again. Okay, so that's one aspect of their theology is that everybody in the Old Testament, New Testament was saved in exact same way, not only justified through faith, but also filled with the spirit of God, the law of God written on their heart, and they received the new covenant even when they were in the old covenant. This is unbiblical, uh, but as I said, it's for their, they, they need it for the, the whole system. Now, another thing that the reformers dealt with is the reform, and covenant theology comes out of the Reformation. The reformers dealt with the fact that the, they wanted to keep baby baptism. Even though scripture teaches that it should be somebody should repent and trust in Christ and then be baptized, they wanted to keep baby baptism. Now, how could they do that if, um, if the Bible says clearly that it's not supposed to be babies baptized, but believers that are baptized? So what they did, and particularly uh, Zwingli worked on this because he had disciples who were Anabaptists. They believed in believers' baptism, and so he was fighting against them in this manner. And he came and he said, look, no, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, everybody's saved in the exact same way under the covenant of grace. So people in the Old Testament are part of the church. People in the New Testament are part of the church. People in the Old Testament are part of Israel. People in the New Testament are part of Israel. So he would make this link that everybody's saved in the same way under this covenant of grace, and and they are all part of the church. So then what's the difference? He would say the only difference, and covenant theology says the only difference is the form. So in the Old Testament, to become part of the covenant people of God, the part of Israel and part of the church, you would have to be circumcised on the eighth day. That was the command that was given, and then you would become part of God's people. Well, in the new covenant, now the focus is on the gospel. It's a a change of form. It's not a change of salvation. The salvation is the same. It's not a change of the church. The church is exactly the same. What changes is the form. So now we no longer uh, circumcise babies, but now we baptize babies. And by being baptized, they come into the church and they are part of the Israel of God. Now, this was beneficial to the reformers, particularly uh, uh, Zwingli and uh, uh, Calvin, because by doing this, then that would mean that the church, everybody in the country, everybody in the city was part of the church. And so the governing authority could be like Israel. They could have a theocracy. They could rule over uh, religious affairs just like they rule over earthly affairs. This is why, uh, you know, in Geneva, they could put witches to death or they could burn heretics at the stake uh, because Calvin believed that they were under a theocracy because they were the new Israel. They had uh, a new form. It was a new form of, you know, baptizing babies and to enter into Israel instead of circumcising babies, but it was Israel nonetheless, and it was a theocracy, so they were under the laws, no longer under the laws of the Old Testament, but now they're under the laws of the New Testament, but they could enforce them with the power of the sword, and they could burn heretics to death. Uh, Zwingli was able to, uh, you, with the power of the council, he was able to hand out the third baptism. What's the third baptism? The Anabaptists, his disciples, whom he originally taught about believers' baptism, but then reverted to being a politician, Zwingli, he would give them the third baptism. What is the third baptism? The first baptism, baptized as a baby. Second, as a believer. The third, they would drown them in the river. Now, why could they get away with drowning people who were baptized as believers in the river? Why could they put them to death? Because in their mind, in covenant theology, the Old Testament and New Testament, Israel and the church, uh, are the same thing. 
And so there's a theocracy in the New Testament under the laws of the New Covenant. So if you broke the, the law of baptism to baptize babies, then we could put you to death because we have the authority to do that as the new Israel because everybody's part of the church. Everybody's under the authority of the church because they were all baptized into the church as babies. It was basically... In the Reformation, there was the Holy Roman Empire with the papacy, and it got broken up into pieces. And then you had another smaller papacy under Luther, another smaller papacy under Calvin, another smaller one under Zwingli. And they all had joined the church power with the, uh, with the state power, with the religious power, and they were able to enforce religious laws. So how does this compare with dispensationalism and uh, Hebraic roots? Well, first let me mention this. Having said that, that sounds awful and terrible. Murder, wickedness, all kinds of evil. I don't want to give the impression that everybody now today who holds to covenant theology is kind of in that mindset. They are certainly not. Uh, thankfully, the Anabaptists have more influence in the West than the Reformers, and so people have an idea that it's supposed to be a, a free state, or a free church. In other words, we're not under a state church. We're under, uh, by our own conscience, we serve the Lord God, and so there's a difference there. But, so, those that are in covenant theology today, the majority, the large majority, do not accept the idea of a theocracy. They're not trying to implement a theocracy in America or anywhere else. They're not trying to do that. They're just holding the fact, like I said, that the gospel is the center and that we need to look at the Old Testament through the gospel. So I want to make that clear. But let's compare this with dispensationalism and Hebraic roots. Now, Hebraic roots... The idea when they come to the Old Testament is that the Old Testament is the foundation. And so the new covenant, they would actually, most of them would say it's not a new covenant at all, but it's a renewed covenant with Israel and Gentiles are allowed to join into that new covenant or a renewed covenant. And so what they would say is that born again believers, Christians are supposed to be ruled under the theocracy or under the laws of the law of Moses. So they would say, yes, it's one covenant, old and new is one joined together, and we need to be ruled by the laws of the old covenant. Now, dispensationalism will come and do the opposite. They'll say, look, the old covenant and the new covenant are so completely different that they're just two different tracks that don't join together. They don't meet. There's Israel, and there's the church, there's the law, and there's the gospel, and these two shall never meet. They're completely separate. Now, what does covenant theology do? Covenant theology is like... Uh, is like Hebraic roots in this sense that they believe that the two covenants are joined together and they're joined by that one overarching covenant of grace that Abraham and uh, me are brothers in Christ, that we were always the same. We were saved in exact same way. The church has always been there. It's been there from Abel. He was part of the church. The church didn't begin at Pentecost. It's always been there. It's been in the midst of Israel the whole time. So they say it's all one. But they would say we're not to be ruled by the old covenant laws, but we're ruled by the new covenant laws. So they would say we are Israel. We The church has always been Israel, and Israel has always been the church, or at least most of Israel, the, the ones that are truly repentant and believe, have always been part of the church. And so now in the new covenant, we see the old covenant fulfilled and we keep the laws of the New Testament. So it's like Hebraic roots in that it joins them into one covenant by the, the covenant of grace. But instead of going back to the old covenant laws in the uh, law of Moses, they focus more on the New Testament laws. So in this degree or in this aspect, it is much better than Hebraic roots, though it has some theological and philosophical mistakes and biblical mistakes. Nevertheless, it's a much better choice than the other two. Uh, dispensationalism is better than Hebraic roots, but covenant theology is going to be much safer and better than both of them. And so if you only have those three to choose from, thank God that there is more. Thank God that there is more clear scripture that we'll continue to go through and what the scripture actually teaches about how we deal with the Old Testament. Nevertheless, if you have to choose one of the three, choose covenant theology. It's going to be the most gospel-centered. But if somebody comes to you and says, oh yeah, and we need to have a theocracy and we need to put the law of Moses as the law of the land, my friend, run from them. Otherwise, you'll end up in Geneva and you might be one that gets burned at the stake. God bless.